Okay, so we're really happy to have uh, Lawrence, aka Tin Lok Wong, um, here to speak about uh, another quantifier result, uh, quantifier elimination results in arithmetic, arithmetic under negated induction. Thank you for joining us from Singapore. Go ahead. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me a chance to speak here. Uh, also, thank you for coming at this maybe non-standard time for the virtual MOPA seminar. It's, well, Roman said it's maybe not too late, but maybe it is a little late in New York. But unfortunately, the talk today I'm going to give may be a little technical. So please feel free to stop me, interrupt me if there is any clarification needed, or if you have any questions or comments, just unmute and speak or type in the Zoom chat. I'll keep an eye on the Zoom chat. At some point, I'll put up the slides on my web page as well. Okay, the results I'm going to present comes from a piece of ongoing joint work with David Belanger, C.T. Chong, Wei Li and Yue Yang, all from the National University of Singapore at the moment. The main theorem we have is a quantifier elimination result in first order arithmetic that is both, well, I claim to be non-trivial and useful. It is probably well known that quantifier elimination does not work for arithmetic. For example, this is a quote on the right here, a quote from the classic model theory text by Chang and Kiesler. And number theory is listed as one of the theories for which the method of elimination of quantifiers does not work. So in the narrow sense, this is provably true. So what I mean in when I refer to my main theorem for the talk is I'm taking this term quantify elimination in a slightly broader sense. So first I'm allowed to have a bigger language. I can expand my language. And secondly, uh, I do not need to eliminate my quantifiers uh, completely. I can maybe change this quantifier to something else as long as it is useful, as long as it helps us understand the arithmetic, then it qualifies as a quantifier elimination result in my sense as well. But having got these relaxations, maybe it is still not obvious what kind of quantify elimination result one can have in first order arithmetic. At least for me, when I started working on this. So how can such a quantify elimination result look like? And secondly, even given such a quantify elimination result, how can one use it? So I hope I got you at least slightly curious about this. And hopefully by the end of the talk, I will be able to satisfy your curiosity on this. So the plan of the talk, I will start by fixing some notation and then maybe give you some hints of why at the beginning, before we have this result, why we would expect such a quantifier elimination result in first order arithmetic. Then I will eliminate the quantifiers, show you how such quantifier elimination results look like. Then I'll look at some applications. How can one use such quantifier elimination results? I'll end with a discussion with some further applications and also maybe how this fits into the big picture. Okay, so let's get started with fixing the notation. I have, I denote by L1 the language for the usual language for first order arithmetic. So it has zero, one plus times less than equality with the usual arities. A quantifier is bounded if its domain of quantification is bounded by a term in the language. If in a, an L1 formula all the quantifiers are bounded, then it's delta naught. From this, we built the formula hierarchy. A formula is sigma n if it has n blocks of quantifiers, starting with an existential one, followed by a delta naught formula. A pi 1 formula is a dual to this. The theory, well, these 
well, let me comment on this formula hierarchy. And it is well known that over relatively weak theories in arithmetic, there are sigma n formulas that are not pi n. So this is what we meant when quantify elimination does not work for arithmetic. So we, when searching for a quantify elimination result, you should keep this in mind and to avoid contradicting this. Lawrence, no, since yes. you said it's okay to ask questions and you know, it's, it's our tradition, when, especially yes. when we meet in person to ask questions. So you mentioned that, um, that this, uh, the hierarchy, arithmetic hierarchy uh, is known yes. under very, some you know, assumptions, but is it well uh, understood what those assumptions need to be to have the arithmetic hierarchy? I think uh, how, how, how low can you go to, to still maintain that? I think I don't know plus X is sufficient. I'm not sure whether it is necessary. Uh huh. I see. I'm not, I'm not but, sure if no, anyone else no, who's no. here knows. Right, because it's, it's an, I think it's an intriguing question. It's like a fundamental property of arithmetic that to, to have this hierarchy and you know what, what really what really depends on. I, I haven't seen that as a subject of any paper. Uh, maybe not, but the usual proof uses a universal sigma n predicate, and there are some right, papers right. on universal sigma n predicates. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think it is open whether there can be such a universal predicate without uh, exp, mm -hmm. and, and that is studied. All right, thank you. Okay. Okay, so uh, then the theories, the theory I sigma n has some basic algebraic axioms that I take to be PA minus. And then there is a scheme of sigma n induction, which states that whenever we have a sigma n definable set, which contains zero closed under adding one, then it contains all the numbers. And PA, piano arithmetic, is the union of all the I sigma M's, so it has full induction. Following con usual convention, I do not have exponentiation in my language, but I will need exponentiation everywhere in my talk. So I need an extra axiom denoted X, which asserts the totality of exponentiation over I sigma zero. Another important theory that we will look at is B sigma n. So it has as base axioms, I sigma zero, and then a scheme of sigma n collection, which says that whenever there is a sigma n definable multifunction with bounded domain, then I can bound the co-domain such that the multifunction remains total. This is B sigma n. One of the important properties of B sigma n is that it says that the formula classes in arithmetic are closed under bounded quantification. So more precisely, if we have B sigma n plus one, then both sigma n plus one and pi n plus one are closed under bounded quantification. And another important properties of these B sigma n's is that they are just another kind of induction axioms it is well known that they sit between the induction schemes. So B sigma two implies I sigma one, I sigma one implies B sigma one, et cetera. And this, all these inclusions, all these implications are strict. This gives us a strict hierarchy of induction schemes. Um, right, but all these, I guess traditionally understood these are pretty local theories. Say if we work in a model of I sigma two, then the model knows very well about sigma two formulas, for example. Uh, maybe it knows a bit about sigma three formulas, then sigma four formulas, maybe it, it knows even less. But if we go to say, if we work in a model of I sigma two, uh, does it know about sigma 1000 formulas? Excuse me, what is PA minus? Uh, PA minus is the yeah. theory of non-negative parts of discretely ordered rings. I think it's just, you take a, a, a ring, discretely order it, take the non-negative part, the theory of those structures is PA minus. 
but for the purpose of this talk, it doesn't quite matter what, what it is. You can take Robinson's Q, for example. Okay, is that okay? Yeah, okay. So, um, so we're talking about these local properties of theories. And I think I was, at least for me, I was quite used to local theories having local implications. If I have I sigma two, the, the consequences are just around sigma two, sigma three, sigma four maybe. But this is not always true. There are cases when actually a rather local theory have rather global consequences. And this is one example of this uh, from K 1997. If we have B sigma n plus one plus X plus not I sigma n plus one, then we know that there can be no definable injection from the universe, the set of all numbers to a bounded set of the universe. So this gives us some, some global property. So it can be the case that you are here, you are just B sigma two, not I sigma two. Then I know that there is no definable injection from the universe to a bounded set. It can be, there is no sigma 1000, defi uh, sigma 1000 definable injection from the universe to a bounded set. Or it can be B sigma three, not I sigma three, B sigma four. Oh, right, uh, Lawrence, Lawrence. Yes, Roman. So, sorry, so, sorry, so one more interruption. So in the theorem, it would be kind of uh, uh, for illustrative purposes, you know, N could be zero. Right, and it's it says exactly the same thing. Right, right. N plays no role. Right, so it's striking. It's quite striking. N plays a role because uh, if I take N equals one, it does not imply the theory for N equals zero. I think. Oh, I see. So, so it's really. Oh, I, it, I it does look right. like a separate statement for each n of, right? because oh, I of the negation I, I, of induction at each. Right, right, um, right, uh, right. I, I understand. Right. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so we are really looking at these levels, B, but not the next I, B, but not the next I. So these these levels here and these are these do not imply one another. Um, and I will call these B levels because this is the maximum level at which we have induction. So we have B, but not the next I. So these are the B levels and the other levels are the I levels. I'll call them, if you have say I sigma one, not B sigma two, or I sigma two, not B sigma three, these are what I would call I levels. And we will see that if you have a model at the B level, you will have very different model theoretic theoretic properties than models that are at the high levels. And this is one example of that. This tells us that there are some global properties at the B levels and all models at the B levels have some pigeonhole principle. It's some very weak pigeonhole principle, but all of them have this. Okay, so how was this proved? Maybe I quickly talk about the the proofs, the original proofs from K used Kappa-like models where Kappa is a singular cardinal. So um, let me remind you, Kappa-like models are just models of cardinality Kappa, all of whose proper initial segments are of strictly smaller cardinality. So clearly, if you are a Kappa-like model, then there is no definable injection from the universe to the bounded set just by counting, just by cardinality. So that's a nice proof. And more recently, there is an alternative proof this is from uh, Kowaje Chik, Kovalik Yokoyama, gave an alternative proof using automorphisms, these automorphisms constructed from a paper by Cossack in the 90s. It's also a very nice proof. If you want, I can, I can quickly talk about that. But both of these are, are model theoretic proofs. See, we do not have a syntactic proof. We had not had a syntactic proof yet, but we know that this is a provability claim. So this theory proves this set of sentences. So there must be a syntactic proof, 
by the completeness theorem. And one might be curious what the syntactic proof looks like. So this is how we started this. And an obvious approach, because we're talking about all definable injections. It can be sigma 1000, sigma 2000, et cetera. An obvious approach that you take is quantifier elimination. Um, so, so this is how this thing started. But having got this hint where we know perhaps quantify elimination lurking in the background, but maybe still it is not obvious how we can start. But one idea that we got was in this alternative proof from Kawajiji Kavalik Yokoyama. So they used automorphisms and the automorphisms were constructed using back and forth systems. And in model theory, if you have back and forth systems, quite probably you have some quantifier elimination. And this was our strategy. So we look, we look very closely at the back and forth system from this paper by Cossack. And we tried to extract a quantifier elimination result out of that and hope that it will help us give a syntactic proof of this theorem of case. Okay, and it, it worked out. We're, I'm, I'm quite pleased about that because even though we have this strategy, it's not clear that it will actually work out, but it worked out. So uh, it's, it's quite nice. Uh, Yes, Lawrence. So, so since I have been interrupt, interrupting already, let me do that. So, is this yeah. the first time that this, as you said, you know, when you have a back and forth system, there is some quantifier elimination lurking at the back. So, has this been noticed, observed before? Because there are tons of different back and forth arguments. And uh, anyway, so has this been done before? You mean in arithmetic? Anywhere. I think these. Well, I don't, I don't know very much model theory, but I think these, uh, what do you call this? These linear orders, dense linear orders without endpoints, or those those very general model theoretic stuff. I think you can, you oh, can have oh, some oh, kind of, yeah. Those are what I had in mind. But if you mm -hmm. talk about arithmetic, what well, you were my examiner for my PhD thesis. So there is something in there uh, uh, about generic cards. I remember. Yes, I still remember yes. that. Yes. So I, I learned all these from K. No, no, no. I remember, you know, because you know, I see my name here. So obviously I get interested. But whatever I knew about those back and forth arguments uh, was really from Swarinsky's. You know, there are yes. several, several papers. So I wonder what there is more into this, something that can be mined for more interesting results. But this is, you know, good. Yeah. Anyway, let, let, let's see how things go. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I have a question too. Yes. Um, when you say negation of I sigma n plus one, that yes. makes perfect sense semantically, but syntactically, it's the negation of a schema. So uh, how, how exactly is it expressed? Uh, I sigma n plus one is finitely axiomatizable over I delta naught plus x. So I just use a just universal over sigma I n. Zero plus x. Yes. Right. So here I'm, I have in mind the finite axiomatization instead of the scheme. Right. So, yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so let's see how this goes. So the plan now first is to shrink the domains of quantification to a cut. So a cut here, um, by a cut, I mean a non-empty initial segment with no maximum. So it's, it's the middle thing that is drawn in the picture. I start with a model of my theory, d sigma n plus one plus x plus not i sigma n plus one. Okay, so we, well, let's not talk about why we shrink the domains of quantification. Let's try and do it, but to what to cut? We have the failure of i sigma n plus one, and it's a standard result that if you have a failure of induction, you get a definable cut 
definable at the same level. So I have sigma n plus one definable proper cut like this in my model. It's sigma n plus one definable. So it's defined by there exists x some pi n formula. And for this, we have a function. This essentially gives us a function from i to x or from i to the least x such that theta holds. And uh, let's call this function g. It goes from i to the least x such that theta holds as mentioned. And one can verify that because we have b sigma m plus one, this function has range cofinal in m. Okay. And this allows us to shrink the domains of quantification anywhere. So if I know there exists V theta, this is equivalent to having there exists V less than some element in the range of G satisfying theta. Because the range of G is cofinal, this will be equivalent to just the un unqualified there exists V. So any unbounded quantifier is equivalent to first an I quantifier together with a bounded quantifier. Where except that this bounded quantifier, the bounding term is not a term in the model. Uh, it's not a term in the language, but it is a, uh, it involves this G, this function. So we can shrink. If we start with such a formula, there exists V2 for row U1, there exists V1 something, then we can change this quantifier to, to an I quantifier and then bounded quantifier for each of them. Okay, that's the first thing we can do. But it looks pretty complicated. You have a mix of these I quantifiers and bounded quantifiers. So let's push all these bounded quantifiers into the into the innermost layer, which we can do because we have collection. So let's look at the last line here. If I have a bounded quantifier and then an I quantifier, this is equivalent to having pulled out the I quantifier. And then the rest are just bounded quantifiers. And this works if the, if the alpha in the middle in the innermost part is delta N plus one. So if we start with alpha being delta n plus one, we can push in all the bounded quantifiers and we're left with just i quantifiers at the, at the outside. And then inside I have a delta n plus one formula. Because we have collection, delta n plus one formulas are closed under bounded quantification. So, well, uh, let me have one more comment. This is, this number four here is a little more general than having than working for delta n plus one formulas. So delta n plus one formulas means it's itself sigma n plus one, but it is equivalent to a pi n plus one formula. But something slightly more general is true. So this equivalence between a sigma n plus one and pi n plus one formula does not need to hold for all parameters. Uh, it just needs to hold for the, well, for the eyes, for the eyes in the, in the bottom here that we are quantifying over the cut. The equivalence, uh, not this one, the equivalence only need to hold for all little i in our cut big i. So it doesn't need to hold for all the, all the elements of the model. So this is slightly more general than than the usual delta n plus one definition. Okay, and that's just a comment. But now we have simplified, well, depending on what you think is not quite simplified, but then we've successfully shrunken the domains of quantification in the formula to a cut. So instead of unbounded quantifiers, I now have I quantifiers, but why is it good to have I quantifiers instead of usual unbounded quantifiers? So there are several reasons. First reason is that very often when we do quantify elimination, we do want to manipulate the quantifiers. Maybe we want to have say universal quantifiers that are more or less the same as an existential quantifier. So if the quantifiers are unbounded, this may be 
this may not be true, but if we have quantifiers over a cut, then it's well known that this is true because we have overspill over a cut. So an overspill can turn a for all quantifier over a cut to an excess quantifier over maybe the complement of the cut. So that's the first good thing about having a quantifier over a cut. And another thing that we might want to do when we do quantify elimination, when we manipulate the quantifiers, is that we might want to change a for all excess into an excess for all. Okay, this will give us some flexibility how we can arrange the quantifiers. And in general, if we have unbounded quantifiers, I cannot just interchange the quantifiers, uh, the order of the quantifiers. But if this is done on, um, on a cut, there is more flexibility. So what? Well, in general, how we can change the order of quantifiers, one, one standard thing to do is columnization. So instead of for raw number, there exists a number. I can say there is a scolum function which works for all inputs of the, of the number. If I have unbounded quantifiers, then the scolum functions are second order objects and we're in first order arithmetic, so we can't quantify over scolum functions. I can't say there is a scolum function. But if we're working over a cut, there is a notion of coded functions on the cut. So we can talk about whether there is a coded scolum function witnessing our for all excess statements. And this is another advantage of shrinking our domain of quantification to a cut. But then we need to have enough coded subsets of the cut. Uh, and we have, because we have basic man plus one, this is, um, this is the theorem that gives us enough coded subsets of the cut from Chong and Murad, which essentially is some kind of bounded sigma n plus one comprehension. So whenever I have, sorry, bounded delta n plus one comprehension, which says whenever I have a delta n plus one definable set, then it is piecewise coded. Whenever I cut it off uh, at B, then the thing satisfied by this delta n plus one formula below B is coded by a set. And again, this is slightly more general in that I can, uh, this is delta n plus one for, for the cut for some of the variables. So slightly more general, and this will be useful. Okay, so with this, we can, we can do scolumization. Okay, let's see how this goes. We've already shrunken the domains of quantifications to the cut. So we have quantifications over the cut and then a delta n plus one formula. Then scolumization. We first scolumize this for raw I1 Derek says J1. What we do, we just given an I1, we take the least J1. Okay, this thing, we just do it over the cut and this thing is coded, is simple enough to be coded. So there is this equivalent to, there is a scolum function from I to I such that for all I1, something happens. Okay, so successfully change for all access to access for all. Okay, then we can do it again. Now we have access for all here. We can do the same. I can change it to for all access in the same way. Change it to for all scolum functions. There exists. There exists these uh, elements such that the some delta n plus one formula holds. So this scolum function takes in two inputs. Firstly, a function from i to i, which comes from this s one, this one, and then it takes in an element of the cut, which is this J2. And then it should return an, an element of the cut, which is this I1. Okay. So this is the, the second scolumization. And then if we try to do it again, it is it seems a little difficult because in, in each of the steps, so the first one, I'm taking the least J1, second one, I'm taking the least 
I1, if we think in terms of the negation. But now I have, there exists J2, there exists S1. Uh, and S1 is supposed to code a function from I to I. And if we take the least S1, I'm not sure whether there will be a function from I to I anymore. But um, there is something we can do about this. But I will not go into the details. The, the trick here is to combine these two existential quantifiers into one existential quantifier over the cut. Uh, the, the intuition is that if we look at coded functions from I to I, then the set of all codes of this has, in a sense, cofinality I. So we have a quantifier over some domain with cofinality I, another one also over I, we can combine the two. And after combining the two, we can take the least K2 and get the next Skolem function. So this is for raw excess, we can take the least K2, we get this, this column function S3, which takes in what I call here, this is this I arrow, I arrow, I arrow, I, I call this a function of type two. I go in here and then I take another element of I, which is from here. And then this returns the, the K2 for me. Okay, then et cetera, et cetera. So if we carry on this way, we can scholarize everything. Okay, and this is our quantify elimination result. But the point is that all these column functions, S1, S2, S3, et cetera, all these are coded in M so that we can describe this in in first order arithmetic in M. Okay, so let's um, let's formulate this theorem properly. So we can scholarize everything. So every formula is equivalent in my model to one formula of this form. There is a scholarm function such that for all bound for the inputs for the scholarm function, something delta n plus one holds. And then this function of type n plus one is defined recursively, just like what we saw on the previous slide, a function of type n plus one takes two inputs. First input is a function of type m, and then second input an element of the cut, and then it returns an element of the cut. Okay, this is what we get from the scholarization. But there is one disadvantage about this is that if you take, for example, um, a pi 10 formula, and then you do this scholarization, the equivalent formula that you get from scholarization is sigma 11. So the complexities do not quite match if you do it this way. But this is quite easy to solve. If you add one more quantifier in front, then the quantifier complexities match. If you start with the sigma m plus n plus three formula, then after scholarization, you get again a sigma m plus n plus three formula in the middle. So the complexities match, which is at least to me quite, quite pleasant, quite nice. We've more or less eliminated, in a sense, eliminated the quantifiers such that it becomes a excess. So this is an existential universal sentence. So we can think of these delta n plus one things as quantifier free because they are piecewise coded by Chong Murad. We can do a little better. This is existential universal. Maybe we can turn it into existential. And this is true, as I said, because, because these are quantifiers over a cut. So I have for all elements in the cut, I can overspell, turn it into an existential quantifier so that the whole thing becomes purely existential in a sense, purely existential. But this only works for, for a bounded part of the model. So if we are only interested in, in 
the numbers that are less than a fixed bound, then I can do overspell. And then I have an existential quantifier instead of a universal quantifier, then the whole thing is purely existential in a sense. So this, these are our quantifier elimination results. We haven't seen how we can use these yet, but um, before I talk about the applications, any questions so far? Uh, I, I I have a quick question here. Yes. Because so we apply all those overspills and codability, but do we know anything about the sort of combinatorial status of those cuts? Uh, are they semi-regular? Are they stronger? Are they regular? And does it really matter? Would, would this procedure be simpler if we, for example, knew that this cut I is strong? Uh, I think we know very little about the second order properties of definable cuts, except when the definable cut is the standard cut. Mm -hmm. And for my construction, it, I have no requirement on my cut I. It, mm -hmm. it just needs to be closed under successor. It may not be closed under addition. Uh -huh. So it may have no arithmetic on it, but oh, if it is closed under exponentiation, then all the codes, instead of saying all the codes have cofinality I, they are actually I. So things simplify a little bit because if we, if we look at the sizes of the codes, they are exponential in I. So if your cut is closed under exponentiation, you don't change the cut when you go to higher types. But the, the arguments still work without closure, with, without any arithmetic on the cut. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is there intersection of all those? You know, is it known they how they behave? You know, is, there like, is there a smallest? Uh, you mean the sigma n definable cuts? Right, right. It does not need to have a smallest. It can have a smallest. Oh, I see. But it need not have a smallest. Mm -hmm. But apart from these, rather little is known. Right, right. But, but whatever you do, it doesn't really matter which i is that. Right? That sort of, you get those equivalences and it also works fine. Right. So far, it doesn't matter. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? So can you go back one slide? Um, I don't yes. actually have a question. I just want to see this one, one, one more time. So yeah, I, I just wanted to see this, uh, the way in which you're combining this, um, the existential, yeah, the exist J2 and then the exist S1 combined into the exist K. Okay. Yeah, I haven't really talked about that, but, uh, but I need to change the, the delta n plus one formula to, for that to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a question. I just wanted to, to, to look at it again. Okay, yeah. So I will, I will carry on, I think, and show you how this can be used. So remember, our motivating application is to look at these pigeonhole principles. K proved that there's no definable injection from the whole model to a bounded set. And if we look at the automorphism argument from Koji Chikurali Kyokuyama more closely, we actually get a slightly stronger result that there is no injection from this number to this number. And by the number, I denote also the set of all numbers strictly less than that. So E is just zero, one up to E minus one. And this thing is a tower of exponentials of non-standard height, so height nu, and then with an E at the top. So as long as the two numbers are far enough apart, say the uh, ex super exponentially apart, then there is no definable injection from the larger number to the smaller number. This is what we can squeeze out of Kowajicic Kovalik Yokoyama. And essentially we have a stratified or stratification of this using our quantifier elimination. 
is that we have more information. We, if we specify a complexity for the definition of the injection, then we know where instead of a tower of non-standard height, we have a standard height where the height relates to the defining formula of the injection. And we have, we have this kind of pigeonhole principle. You cannot go from this very, very large number to this number A. But this is, so this E here is just any number above the sigma n plus one definable cut and A is any number. A does not need to be in the cut, does not need to be above the cut, etc. But in addition to being a stratification of this Kawajiji Kavali Kyokuyama, it has slightly more information that in the Kawajiji Kavali Kyokuyama, what we see is that if the size of the co-domain is much bigger than the size of the, sorry, size of the domain, much bigger than the size of the co-domain, then we do not have an injection. But what we see from our quantifier elimination result is that the absolute sizes of the domains, co-domains are, are not important. What is important is the ratio between the sizes of the domain and the co-domain. The A here does not matter. And that we do not see from the earlier arguments. Okay, so how do we use this? Let me uh, show you this. Suppose I have a sigma n plus n plus three definable injection from B to A. Then I will show you at the end that this B will have to be less than or equal to this big number here so that Whenever you have an injection, the domain cannot be too large. This is the kind of pigeonhole principle that we want. Well, how do we do it? We have a sigma m plus n plus three formula. So by our quantifier elimination result, it's equivalent to some quantifier eliminated form. And since we are working with a bounded definable set, we are working with an injection from B to A. So uh, the inputs are less than B, outputs less than Y. So it's a bounded set, so we can use the purely existential form of a quantifier elimination. So this is it. But what's the advantage of having it in this purely existential form? It says that we can define the graph of our injection as there exists this, there exists this. So it's a union of some sets. It's the union over I over S over K of some set that I denote by F I S K um, defined in a natural way. And each of these F I S K are coded. So the, the, the set A here is coded. We're doing something delta naught to it. So the whole thing is coded. We have I delta naught plus X for that. So, I have decomposed the graph of our very compli complicatedly defined injection into a union of coded sets so we can count. So how do we count the elements of the graph of F? Well, how many ISK do we have? We just count how many elements, how many little i's there are, how many k's there are. There are at most e many i's, at most E many Ks. And if you look at functions of type M plus one, it's, um, it's this number many of functions of type M plus one. So iterated exponentially many. So this is the number of coded sets that we have in this union. But how big are these coded sets? Well, each of these coded sets is a subset of the graph of F and F is an injection. So being subsets of the graph saying that these are actually graphs of injections with the same codomain, codomain A here. So we have a coded injection from some set to, to A. So the sizes, the cardinalities of these are at most A because in I delta naught plus X, we already have a pigeonhole principle for coded injections. We cannot have 
coded injections from A plus one to A. So since these are injections with codomain A, the sizes will have to be at most A. So if we look at this union, we are taking the union of this many sets, this many sets, each of the sets size A. So the total number of elements, well, an upper bound of that is just the product of the two, which is this thing as required. Okay, so this gives us some pigeonhole principle that, that all models at the B level will possess. Okay. Any questions about this argument? So at the I level, one would not have such pigeonhole principle that come automatically. Okay, so maybe I will, since there are no questions, I would just comment on this. If we're at the I level, then it's possible that you get pigeonhole principles failing very badly. You might have a rather simple bijection that goes from the whole model to the standard cut. So it's pigeonhole principle failing in the worst possible way. Okay, so maybe I will skip the next application because of time. So um, there is something we, we can derive from, from, the, from the unprovability. We get some probability as well. But the next thing I wanted to say, maybe I just say quickly, is that it relates to second order arithmetic. I'll just comment on this, is that when we do second order arithmetic, we have second order parameters. And one of the usual questions that we ask in second order arithmetic is, well, if we start with uh, a first order model, we want to make it into a second order model. So we add sets. In the process, we want to preserve the amount of induction that we have, but maybe change something. So the question is, if we preserve the amount of induction, what can we change? And the quantifier elimination result that we have tells us that if, if we're at the B levels, then there isn't much we can change if we want to preserve the amount of induction that we have. Um, that's roughly what it says, but it's what this is saying is that if I have a model at the B level, I expand it so that I preserve the amount of induction that I have, then whatever you can define in the expansion is already definable without expanding. If you can define with the additional sets that you add to the model, and define without the sets. And the reason for that is that this quantify elimination result that we have is a purely existential form. It also works in the second order context. It relativizes directly like this. So if you have a formula is equivalent to one of this form, but if we look at the equivalent formula, uh, it has no second order parameter in it. It has i, but i is sigma n plus one definable with no set parameter. The, the a here, the a here is, is just a coded set. It's coded by an element. The whole thing does not mention anything second order. So whenever you have, whenever you can define something in an expansion, satisfying the same amount of induction at the B level, then you can define it without any second order parameters, which is a little but, unexpected to me. Yes, Roman. But, but, but do, you, do you get new first order parameters? It's all parametric definability. I will, in general, as far as this quantify elimination goes, I will need new uh, parameters. So uh, this doesn't show that it's neutral or something like that. 
Uh, I, I will understand you. I didn't quite understand this construct, but every step requires some new parameters. You add many eventually. Right, so uh, they, they can, you can on, you can you can combine them into one, but you have to add something. Yes. Well, actually, in each of the steps, if you are just looking in at the at the other version where I have for raw k in i alpha s i k set, then no new parameter is needed. If I just mm -hmm. look at this, it's just the last step when I overspell, I have to code mm -hmm. the alpha with a number. Mm -hmm. So in I no see. other step, I I introduced a, a new number parameter. I see. Okay. Yeah. So it is. It is not a neutral expansion in your sense, I think. At least the, the argument doesn't show that. And this is, I'd say, a characteristic maybe of the B levels. At the B levels, we do not have that many expansions. We cannot define new bounded sets, preserving the amount of induction that we have. Um, because at the I level, you can define whatever you want. At the I level, if you start with a countable model at the I level, then you can, pres you can expand, preserving the amount of induction that you have and define any subset uh, of the first order universe. So it's pretty much the opposite for the I level. So really there is some kind of bifurcation if we look at the B levels and the I levels for arithmetic. So, sorry, a little hasty at the end, but um, let me wrap things up. So this is our quantifier elimination result. I've put this in the purely existential form, which, is, which only works for bounded, a bounded part of the model. I hope you would at least partially agree that this is both non-trivial and useful. But the idea of this, let me repeat, the idea of this quantifier elimination is that I first shrink the domains of quantification to a cut, and then I exploit that to scolemize everything. And this is what I get. Now, this is a... Uh, Another comment that I'd like to add is that this is a models of PA seminar. I have not looked at any models of PA yet, so I should at least mention some as I only have a few minutes left. So if we look at say countable recursively saturated models of PA, look at any proper cut, we can actually apply our quantifier elimination result to that cut. So it is because we can use an argument from this paper of Cossack, essentially ascending sequence of skies. Uh, we can use that to make any proper cut of a countable recursively saturated model of PA sigma zero n plus one definable. And as long as we can make it sigma n plus one definable, we can apply this. And this application maybe partially answers a question from K from this conference that some of you were at, maybe, about, so the question was whether there is any cuts in models of PA that admit a non-trivial quantifier elimination result. So this probably is non-trivial, and I say it's just partially answers that because this involves an expansion. So I will need to, I need to expand my model of PA such that I make the cut sigma n plus one definable, that this is a conservative, this is, this expansion is rather conservative. So it's maybe not too bad. Another comment about models of PA is that, well, maybe not only models of PA, that because of this quantifier elimination and other things we know about B models, we know that if I have a model of arithmetic that expands to a B model, they have nicer model theoretic properties in general. And this was observed rather early, I think in late, late 80s, early 90s by Cossack. And he called these not always semi-regular models. Uh, and in the 
specific case when the definable cut is the standard cut, you call this models with the omega property. But not many people followed up on this. I, as far as I know, no one followed up on this. And I think it's uh, people should look more at these. I think there is more one can one can get from this. And um, these are kind of generalizations of countable recursively saturated models. And a final comment is that all these are only possible if we have the, the negation of an induction action in it. If I do not have a negation of induction, the whole thing does not work. And this is maybe another, how this, how this fits into the big picture is that if we want to understand the model theoretic properties of models of arithmetic, we probably have to look at such theories. If we know precisely how much induction we have in my model, then we have better information and we have, we know the model better. And this is an insight that probably Kay proposed at around 1991. And with this, I end my talk. Thank you for listening. Okay, let's uh, let's thank our speaker. That was great. Um, that, yeah, I, I I really enjoyed it. Um, so thank you. I I'm I'm happy to open this up for questions, and um, you know, uh, we can you know go as long as people have the. Uh, the the time because uh, I'm sure some some people can stick around and some might not. So anyone has a question, go ahead and feel free to unmute. Okay, thank you, Noah. Well, no, no, to wait. So if no, no one else has other questions, then I I just have, uh, you know, and. And it, it is a naive question, but uh, nevertheless, perhaps needs to be asked. But this is what Laurie asked at the, at the beginning, you know, you negate uh, sigma and plus one induction, and it's fine, you know, it's, it's actually a single sentence. But it would be interesting if there was a possibility of some finer analysis based on how badly induction fails on the particular instance. You know, because there could be all kinds of sigma and plus one formulas for which induction holds, and then some other for which it fails. And maybe there is some fine information that's carried by this kind of failure. This was sort of what I was thinking while asking about the cuts. What cuts actually can be defined by failure of sigma and plus one induction? Uh, is there anything interesting? Is there some information that this failure of induction carries specifically in this particular case and not in other cases? But you know, I understand there are no really sort of there is no framework to even ask questions like that. Mm, right. So I am not aware of any say hierarchy of sigma n plus one formulas. I don't know. Do you? Oh, no, 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 there are. This is where Paris and Dimitrakopoulos, on a K, you know, when, when you forget in parameters, that if you have those non, you know, if you have levels, in the, they actually, it splits, it splits into, into an infinite tower. You know, as far as I remember, there is a tower of inductions when you forget parameters. Okay. Yeah, that I don't know much about. No, not, neither do I, but I know that, you know, there's a whole paper of, of K. Dimitrakopoulos in Paris on, on, on parameter-free uh, sigma induction. Yeah, okay. But... But there may be something, uh, something uh, there, because the, in some models, as far as what we know, if we have a parameter or we do not have a parameter, the, the defining formula of the cut may, may differ by one. So there may be some right. difference right. there, but okay. I don't, I haven't tried no, that. No, 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 but it would be fascinating if something interesting came up like that at the, at the at zero level, you know, sort of when you have some formulas that actually say something number theoretic or something intelligible. Uh, so let, let's yes. go to Haim. Um, uh, yes, no. uh, is there a paper 
Is the talk covered by a paper or does no. the paper come after the talk? The paper may come uh, after, well, many months after the talk because it's still ongoing work and we're still exploring further applications of this. But you have sufficient results for a paper, I think. Okay, that's great. Actually, we, well, actually, I thought I had much more information about, uh, much more applications of this, say about go final extensions, etc. But then just before I sent out the abstract, I found a gap in the proofs and then we have much fewer results than we expected. So we're just, we're still counting how many things we have at the moment and see whether it's publishable. But it's good oh. to hear that you think it's publishable. No, it's, it's organized, but can you say a couple of words about what applications for cofinal extensions did you have in mind? Uh, it's, it's also like follow-ups from your paper. So you had in your paper some models such that all cofinal extensions with the same standard systems are isomorphic to the original model. Right. And we're trying to generalize that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, because it seemed to be the notion of saturation, right? That yes. Idea. Yeah. That sounds really interesting. I like to say I like to say that as well. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask if so. If these these uh, these issues with I models not having. Um, not having the, uh, the same kind of quantifier elimination result. Um, it, it, I mean, it, it, it does, it seems that everything is mostly dependent on having some sort of definable cut. And then at that point you get the QE result for that cut, right? And yes. so if it's, a, if, it's, if it's a model of I sigma five, but not I sigma six, then you should still have some some sort of results, um, some sort of uh, analogous QE results for that, would you not? Say if you have I sigma five, not B sigma six, is that what no, you mean? No, uh, both I's, I think. What, what, what happens you know, if you forget about the B? The B? Yeah, I, I was just saying, okay, if you don't have I sigma six, so in particular, you get a failure of induction at the sigma six level and whether or not you have collection there is, um, you know, uh, I, I guess if you have collection, then it follows from what you had already. But in, in you know, if you, if you so, so maybe the, that's the more interesting case anyway. Um, but yeah, I was just saying, if you have a failure of induction at, at one level, then don't you get your you get your definable cut and then you can do something with that and maybe get your QE result as um, so so the interesting case is when I have yeah. I sigma five, not B sigma six. Mm -hmm. uh, then at least the arguments that we have uh, do not work anymore because we need the coding and the coding will need the the collection at, at this at the next level. Uh, okay. At, yeah, at the next level, mm -hmm. but there are similar, maybe you can call them quantifier elimination results at this this eye level. I think it comes from a paper by Adamovich and Roman, uh, intermediate induction schema, I think in, in the fundamenta. So there is something on that line. I'm not sure what applications, I, I don't remember what applications <laughs> you had. No, 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 uh, no, there was no, it's, you know, uh, Lawrence, thank you very much for uh, you looking at those papers, because I think no one else has ever looked at them. Um, and maybe there, there was a reason that no one else, no, but the, the only, the only purpose of this paper to show that the uh, collection schema is equivalent to something, to, to, to something that looks like induction schema for a class of formulas. So to, to represent collection in a form of induction for a restricted class of or some well-defined class of formulas. So that was the result in itself, but we didn't have any applications for it. Okay, yeah. But I think that kind of 
one of the things I remember from that paper is that it shows that these collection actions are not only sufficient to, to make the formula classes closed under bounded quantification, but they are oh, necessary. Right. right, right, right. Yeah. All right, so that might be, um, it, that might make it not very, not even doable then. Um, if you don't have collection at that level. So I have to think about that. Somewhere. Um, at least our argument will not work. Right. right. Okay, any, uh, any other questions? Yes, yes. Um, yes. Some of us heard a talk by Koa Jacek and he uh, was characterizing the B models versus I models in terms of uh, how much saturation they have. And mm -hmm. do, do you know, I can, is your work related to that somehow? Or do you know that? Uh, how much saturation? So, um, so there is. I think it would not be the usual kind of saturation, say, but it's, uh, let's find some, maybe find some space for it. Uh, okay, so if we have, say, so something that we can have, if we have B sigma two, not I sigma two, then I know that it is either is either sigma two recursively saturated or it is short pi two recursively saturated. I think that's something that we know because if both of them fail, so if they both fail, then that would mean that the standard cut is delta two definable, which which contradicts delta two definable, and then this contradicts uh, B sigma two. So at these B levels, I think we have these kinds of uh, weird disjunctions of saturation. But this is not uniform. If B sigma two, then I have, I have this for the sigma two level. If we have uh, B sigma three, these are at the sigma three level. So this, so this is one suggestion. Another suggestion is that um, this was a theorem of K's, I think. So K proved that every model at the B level has a proper, every countable model uh, at the B level has a proper cofinal extension. Uh, cofinal extension. And this is, and this having a proper cofinal, elementary cofinal extension. So this property of having a proper cofinal extension is equivalent to, to some kind of some kind of saturation. I think it's omega tall or something like that. I don't quite remember. This is from Schmel. Mm -hmm. So every countable B model has this kind of saturation which does not depend on the, the level, the B level that you have, whether it is B sigma two or I sigma two, or B sigma two or B sigma three, et cetera, is the same. And then the last one that comes to mind maybe from Roman is that all these models have continuum many automorphisms. I don't know of any saturation notions corresponding to that or B models, countable B models. Uh, 
have continuum many automorphisms. I'm, maybe maybe Roman knows about this. No, 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 for PA, it's not a notion of saturation. It can be very unsaturated and have lots of automorphism. So, but for fragments, especially for this fragment, but in itself, it seems uh, not really connected to saturation. It's a consequence, but not the other way. So, Roman, what do you mean by it can be very unsaturated? unsaturated. Uh, well, well, maybe the only thing that's implied that you cannot be finitely generated. Yes. But other than that, well, you said it can be short. Yes, short can still be quite saturated. It can be short because we saturated. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right, but. Uh, no, but you don't, you know, look at, at Heims here, look at Heims, you know, the, the, a model generated by an omega sequence of, of minimal types. It's very unsaturated, it realizes very few types, doesn't code any of, of its theory. Yes. You, you, you take an omega sequence of indiscernibles and then clue. Okay. So it seems like it seems very unsaturated. It's not lofty. You know, loftiness would be nice if it came somehow in this, those considerations, but 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 it's very unsaturated. Okay, I see. And, and is the first bullet that you mentioned in your paper with Ali? Yes, I think so, but it's not. It's, it's a con consequence of something that you have there. Or, yes. or is something easy to notice? It's, it's something easy to notice. This is just uh -huh. saying that the standard cut is not sigma uh -huh. 2 definable. Mm -hmm. And this is saying that the standard cut is not pi 2 definable. Mm -hmm. So if both of them fail, the standard cut is both sigma 2 and pi 2 definable, so it's delta 2 definable. But in B sigma two, I have a uh, least number principle for delta two things. So we cannot have this. Okay, uh, anything else? All right, um, let's, let's thank Lawrence again. Um, so this, uh, thank you. this concludes our uh, our, our semester for MOPA. So um, thank you for, for, finishing, for, for giving us a nice talk to, to end with. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll keep everyone posted in terms of what we do next year. Uh, there is a raised hand.